Dear God, I want to know the real you, not the Jesus I pretend you are to be, not the Jesus I hope that you can be, but the God who exceeds my expectations. The God who goes above and beyond all I ask and imagine. A God who contradicts me so I can continue to grow into all that you've made me to be. Thank you for loving me just as I am right now. Thank you for loving the real broken me and not some future version of myself more. Use me in all my broken pieces to bring you glory. Help me to build your kingdom, your way and not mine. My heart and mind are open to receive your love, grace, and hope. My heart and mind are open to receive your love, grace, and hope. Amen. Hey, well, welcome. It's so good to be with you all tonight. I want to also give a special welcome to all those who are tuning in, whether it's online or for our pre-recorded. Could we just right now make some noise for everybody who's just experiencing God's presence with us? Tune in and online. We love y'all, and we're so glad you're a part of our family, wherever you're at. Hey, well, I am excited for tonight because we are coming into a landing of our series called Jesus Unfiltered. We got one more week of it, and over the past two months, we have been taking a look at who the person of Jesus is and the, his real teachings, what he really taught, how he really called us to build his kingdom, and how God really reveals himself uh, to the world around us and through us. And how many of you know you want a real faith, right? You don't, you don't want that cheap, fake kind of faith, but you want the real one, the one that Jesus really preached and really lived out. And I think with what's happening in our nation today, uh, I'm seeing all over Facebook, and maybe you guys are as well, just People are just trying to win their arguments on their political side. It's us just so political, is it not? Like, I actually deleted my Instagram and Facebook for a few days because I was just tired of seeing it. I was tired of seeing all the just the arguments and the, the chitter chatter and bitterness that was going on. And it was just so frustrating me uh, to see everybody just trying to win. Like, it didn't matter how they talked to other people because their side needed to win. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever been a part of that? Okay, I have too. Like, we're, you're trying to get your point across, you know, on Facebook, and you, you say that one liner, and you're like, man, I shut them up. I know I did good there. Like, they're going to for sure change to my view now because I did that because I was a jerk. They got to for sure follow where I'm headed now. And I just think we just have this idea of always wanting to win. Like, we just got to win, and no matter the cost, like, it's got to be our way or, or the highway. There's no other way to go. And, and I'd like for us to take a look at Scripture to see how God actually calls us to win, how Jesus defines what true winning is, how Jesus defines what conquering looks like. And so if there's a, a title of my message today, if you're a note taker, it's this, How to Conquer Like Christ. Because I want to win in this life, don't you? I want to do some winning in my days, but I want to do it his way. I want to do it the way he defines it as conquering and winning. And so if you maybe, maybe you're watching online or maybe you're here and you don't really um, consider yourself a committed follower to Jesus, that's okay. I'm hoping by the end of tonight's teaching, you just see another kind of way that maybe you can win. And maybe tonight it would be the night that speaks hope and life to you and maybe encourages you in a new direction of where you're headed. And so would you journey with me to one of my favorite passages? Well... It better be one of my favorite passages because I got it tattooed on my body. Uh, the book of Revelation, actually, Revelation chapter 5, if you'll journey with me there. Now, I, f I feel like as soon as I said uh, the, the word, the book of Revelation, it, it kind of feels like air gets sucked out of the room. Because how, have, how many of you have ever experienced those weird people that are all about the charts? You know, and how the, how the, how the end of the world's going to happen. You ever see that meme with that girl? She's got the math and she looks confused in her face. Like, you know, you think that I'm going to do one of those. Well, put, bring the charts up on the screen for me, would you? I'm just kidding. We're not going to put no charts up. It, I, think, I think a lot of times when we talk about Revelation, uh, people get just so freaky and weird about it. They just, they're always trying to figure out which president is the evil one. You know, how's the world going to end? When's doomsday coming? You know, if we're trying to figure out, trying to decode it like the Da Vinci Code and reading it, you know, they, they got all, the, all these different colors and pictures in it. I don't know. Maybe you haven't encountered that. I have. And they make it just weird. They make Christianity weird. And I want us to actually go there because I believe it's going to help us discover what winning actually looks like in this life and how Jesus defines what winning looks like. Um, if I could maybe clarify a little bit on uh, what the book of Revelation is about. Uh, just to set the, the stage and the pace of where we're headed. Uh, newsflash, maybe to some of us, the book of Revelation is not just about the end of the world. 
It's not about the future wars that are coming to America with helicopters and bombs. It's not about which president is the Antichrist. It actually is a revelation of Jesus and from Jesus. Quote, that's why it's called the book of Revelation. It's Jesus revealing himself and how he builds his kingdom, how he calls his people to live. And it's an encouraging letter that Jesus reveals himself to the Apostle John, who is exiled on an island all by himself, left to die. And he receives these visions from God to encourage the people because these people are going through difficulties. Have you ever gone through something real difficult and you feel like, where is God? And like, if somebody were to say to you in a difficult moment, it gets greater later. Like, wouldn't you want to just sock them in the face? You know, like, that's not what I need to hear right now, okay? And that's, that's what the people are going through. They're actually under the reign of this evil Roman emperor named Domitian. Not Dalmatian, but Domitian. And it's about 95 AD, and Domitian is actually killing Christians. If they, don't, if they don't worship him, if they don't pay honor to him and pay money at these local cults and these businesses where commerce is happening, he takes away their businesses, he rips them from their families, and he even kills them in broad daylight. And that's the stage, that's the political climate they're in. So how many of you know they probably want a new president, right? That's the political climate they are in, and they're struggling. And so the Apostle John writes to encourage them. And uh, we reach uh, Revelation chapter 5, where John receives this vision of heaven. And in this vision, God is standing on the throne, or God is sitting on the throne, and he has a scroll in his hand with seven seals. And this scroll is the answer to the people's prayer. This scroll unleashes their, their prayers, the redemption they need, the change they need, and the people are crying for God. God, how long until you avenge our blood? How long until you answer our cries? How long until you get this evil dude out of the, out of the, the office and give us somebody who loves the Lord? How long, O oh Lord? And, and John receives a vision, and all of heaven is silent. And there is no one found worthy to open this scroll and to accomplish God's will in the earth. And it says all of heaven weeps. And he begins to weep. And we come to Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, and it says this. And it says, one of the elders said to John, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Somebody say conquered. Come on, say it like you want to conquer. Conquer. He has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Now, for some of you who maybe aren't too familiar with the Old Testament, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, are just Old Testament. They're, they're Bible uh, references to Jesus, the person of Jesus. If you love the Old Testament, go to Genesis 49 and Isaiah 11. You'll find those quoted there. They're actually referencing Jesus as the promised king who will come and bring about true change, the promised king who will come and bring about real redemption and real saving of people's lives. He'll be the one to lead with peace. He'll be the one to lead with love and build a kingdom of love. And he'll do it through himself in his, own, in his own power, strength, and wisdom by the Spirit of God. And it says he conquered. This roaring lion of Jesus conquered. And I, wa I want you to pause for a moment and think about that, conquer. What comes to mind? What do you imagine when you hear the word conquer? What comes to mind when you hear that word? I think for some of us, we think winning at all costs. No matter what it takes, taking out our enemies decimating everybody. If you're ever a video game player, maybe you know what it, this, this is what it's like. You know, just pulverizing. You ever use the word pulverizing? Just taking everybody out, like making everybody bend their knee, like everybody's going to submit my way or the highway. Conquer means I'm taking them out. It means I'm convincing them of, of my views. I'm going to win no matter what. That's what we think of when we think of conquer, don't we? We're winning. And man, they better be on board or else. That's what, that's what we think of when we hear conquer. But I think when we take a look at the scripture and we continue, there's a different definition of conquer. Let's continue this verse. Let's head to verse 6. Because they hear this roaring line and it says this, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a, a what? Somebody help me out. Somebody help me out read this. I saw a, a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Now wait a minute. He just said the conquering lion. And when he looks, he sees a bloody lamb. How does that make sense? That's fascinating to me. That's interesting to me that he's actually paralleling a victorious lion with a meek and slain lamb. That they're actually two in the same thing. They're actually the same thing that he's saying. You know, when Jesus was crucified, the people thought Jesus lost. 
because they wanted Jesus to be a political leader. They wanted Jesus to, to remove the Romans out of the area and be their political redeemer. And the crucifixion looked like defeat. But how many of you know what happened three days later? It wasn't a defeat of all. It was actually the greatest victory you and I could ever experience because he saved us from our sins. He purchased us to have a new life. He gave us hope in a future. Come on, sometimes what looks like defeat is actually victory. There are some things in your life that are happening and you think, man, it's over. I'm done now. There's no future. There's no hope for me. This is done and it's over with. I don't know how I'm going to make it through. I lost. I quit. And you think you lost. You think you've been defeated. You think this is the end. But I'm here to tell you it is through defeat that victory rises. It was through Jesus' death on the cross that he was able to rise three days later and defeat our sin and defeat death and defeat the works of the devil. And he brought new life for you and I. So no matter where you are in your stage right now, you can experience his hope. The conquering lion was a slain lamb. I want to talk about this because I think a lot of us during the season, and maybe, maybe it's more so your parents, but it might be you as well, we think we need a, a good political leader to bring change to this nation, don't we? Man, if we just got a good godly person in office, then maybe it'd bring about change. But I'd like to submit to you that our text teaches us something else. The most influential change is not one through a political leader. It's in pursuing the way of the Lamb. The greatest change this nation will experience, the greatest change you will see happen in your life is not through any law or legislation that is put out. Because laws and legislations cannot change our hearts. It is only the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross that can change your life. That can renew your hope. That can forgive you of your sins. That can wash you away from all the guilt and all the shame that you carry. It is only through the way of the Lamb. It is only through His sacrifice on the cross. But some of us were thinking, man, if we, just, if we just got somebody in there who told us what to do and he just kicked out all the bad people and all the enemies and all the people that didn't do what we wanted, then maybe we'd see change. But that's not how change comes about. It comes through humility and sacrifice, patience and long-suffering, gentleness and forgiveness. That's the way of the Lamb. That was the way that Jesus paved to show true change in our lives. So whenever you hear conquering, I want you to shift in your mind the definition. I want you to think about sacrifice. Whenever you hear of success, I want you to think about serving. Success doesn't mean you have a ton of people serving you. Success means you're able to serve more people. That's true success. Whenever you hear winning, it's about giving away, not gaining. That's true winning in God's kingdom. Whenever you think of power, think of humility and laying it down. That's winning in God's kingdom. It's how much I can give away. Come on, some of us, we are confused. We got it flipped. We think for me to win in life, it's going to be about how everything's going to benefit me. Well, I'll be the CEO of an organization, and I'll have all this money, and everybody will know my name, and I'll be able to, at the beck and call, have everything to happen for me. And we think that's winning. But Jesus says, you want to win? What are you willing to lose? You want to know if you're winning? Look at how much you're willing to lose and give away. That'll tell you if you're winning in my kingdom. He flips it on us. Are you willing to lose your attitude to love somebody who maybe cussed you out? Are you willing to lose your pride and lay down your, your strength of your political stance to see and hear and listen to the hurt that person feels? Are you willing to lay it all down, your selfish ambitions, to go serve somebody who doesn't add any value to your future? Are you willing to win like Jesus says? That's the most influential change that will take place in this nation. Winning how he does, conquering how he does not getting the most godly man in the office. It starts with you and I in our hearts and saying, I'm going to posture my heart to win like Jesus. And if a conquering lion, if the victor looks like a slain lamb, then I'll follow the path he's led. And I'll live a life of sacrifice and selflessness. Let's continue. Revelation 5, 6. It said, though he was slain, he had seven horns and seven eyes. Oh boy, here we go. Let's do this thing. The lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. Are we watching a Halloween movie? What are we doing, what are we doing here? This, are we going to see a bloody seven horns, seven eyed lamb in heaven when we, like we get in the pearly gates and we see that? I think I'm in the wrong place. You know, like you turn around like, I, I don't know if this is heaven, y'all. I think I may be walking to the wrong place. It, right? it feels that way, don't it? It feels that way. Well, let me, let me help you out here. Uh, the Apostle John is using very rich symbolism. The, the book of Revelation is actually very symbolic. Um, it's not to be taken literally. 
Uh, John uses very rich symbolism from the Roman uh, world, Roman language, and Old Testament language that the Jews understood. And so actually, he was primarily speaking to a Jewish audience that was under this persecution. And what's interesting about that is because the Jews, there, when they had numbers, they actually had significance to their numbers. That when they said a number, not only did it mean three, but it also meant something else. It had theological significance. So when he says seven, the Jewish people knew that it means fullness completion and perfection seven is the number of perfection in their mind so when they hear seven they're thinking perfection fullness complete final our future hope and so when it says he has seven horns and seven eyes let me explain to you horns in that day and age were a symbol uh, uh, for for power and authority for influence and, and control so animals that had horns were usually the most powerful animals and they dominated right and eyes were, were, were symbols of, of vision and wisdom and, and truthfulness and comprehension and knowledge. And so what's being described here is Jesus is the most powerful and wise of every leader, of any person that walked the face of the earth. He holds all power in his hand. He holds all wisdom in his mind. And yet what's most interesting to me is this. When Jesus walked the earth and he knew he was going to be betrayed and he knew he was going to be crucified, he holds all power. Scripture says he could have called a legion of angels to cast away all his enemies and not receive another uh, punch to his face or a whip to his back. But yet he didn't. He laid that power down. Scripture says that Jesus is all wise. He has the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the spirit of knowledge and truth. And when he, when he was on the way to the cross, he could have convinced everyone he was the son of God. He could have convinced them he was the Messiah. Yet what does he do? Scripture says he remains silent like a lamb to its shearers waiting to be slaughtered. Jesus had all power and he had all wisdom. And what did he do with that? He laid it down. And he sacrificed himself on the cross. He laid it down for you and I. And he calls us to do the same. This is a beautiful picture to me that the one who was most powerful and most wise chose to lay it down for our sake, for my sake. He could have stopped the suffering with the snap of his fingers. He could have convinced them to stop what they were doing, but yet he let it continue unjustly because he loved you and I, because he couldn't imagine a heaven without us. He couldn't imagine you, even in your broken state right now, with all your shame, all your hidden sins, all the things you are so ashamed about that you don't want to tell a single soul. He saw that version of you. He says, I'll remain silent and I'll lay down my power for that version of you. The real broken you because I love you and I can't imagine a heaven without you. And he calls us to live the same. Let's take a look at Revelation uh, verse 12, uh, 11, or chapter 12, verse 11, I'm sorry. Because it talks about how the people of God also conquered like Jesus. It says this, and they conquered him. Who did they conquer? The devil and his ways. How he convinces you to live this life. How he convinces you you need more money, more success, more fame, more, more followers. How he says you should have power in this life. How he defines success and winning. He says they conquered this, that system of the world. By how? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Now, a lot of people stop here when they read the verse, and they use that as their victory verse. Like, I'm going to overcome anything because the blood of the Lamb and word of the testimony. That's in the Christian circles. A lot of people say that. But uh, they miss the most important part of the verse, and that's the end. What does it say? For they loved not their lives, even unto death. They conquered because they lost their lives. They found life when they lost it. They found true life and true abundance when they were willing to give away that which they were trying to keep. It's saying the same thing over and over. You want to conquer in this world? You want to win in this life? You want to experience life to the fullest? Follow, follow this. The blood of the lamb, the sacrifice of Jesus. Live a life of sacrifice. The word of your testimony. Faithful to what he taught. He taught us to serve. And what? Loving your lives, not even under death. That means being loyal to him even if it costs me my life. That is true winning. That is true winning in this life. And that's what Jesus did for us. The call to conquer does not mean we are spared from suffering. But it does mean he's promised us his presence. He says you're going to win in this life, but it doesn't mean it's going to be without suffering. But what that does mean is my, pre my presence will always go with you. I promise my presence to go with you. 
That's why he suffered all alone and was abandoned on the cross, so we would never have to be alone when we go through suffering. That's why he faced the worst suffering, and he was tempted in every way, so we'd never have to go through it alone. So wherever you're at right now, Christ's presence can be revealed to you. Whatever difficulty, whatever trial, whatever anger, whatever frustration, he can meet you right now because he's gone through it all. And you are never closer to God than when you are in suffering and difficulty. That is the closest place you can get to God. It, have you ever read the book, um, The Chronicles of Narnia? Maybe, maybe y'all never read that. It's, I, I, maybe some of you are against that. Oh, maybe I should be careful. <laughs> Well, in, in one of the books, in the Chronicles of Narnia series, uh, there's a picture of uh, this lion, and it's Aslan. He's a picture of God, right? And uh, he, there's this boy named Diggory, and Diggory has a sick mother. She's very ill, and she's going to die. And uh, he's looking for the healing of his mother. He, he desperately wants his mom to live. And he hears that there's a special apple that would bring healing to his mother. And if you know the story better than me, and I'm slaughtering it, forgive me, okay? Give me grace. But this is how I remember it. And uh, as Diggory is going, he's crying because he doesn't think he can get to this apple in time to save his mother. And Aslan is there, this big roaring lion that is known to be dangerous and, and uh, pretty scary. And he's right there, and, and Diggory's crying, and he's on his hands and knees just weeping. And uh, Aslan is there, and he's just picturing this big scary lion, and I'm sure he's saying, man, what can I do to, to save my mother? What can I do to heal my mother? And it's almost like he feels so alone and hopeless. And it says in the book that he looks up and it says, wonder of wonders, he sees Aslan's eyes and behold, big bright tears are in his eyes as if he's sorrier than Diggory is for his own mother. And I don't know where you're at right now in this difficult journey of life. I don't know where you're at in your frustrations of life. But I know this, Jesus is always the first to cry for you. And his presence is always near. And you are never closer to his presence than when you are brokenhearted and crushed in spirit. And he promises to meet you there. He promises to meet you there. Scripture says a smoldering wick he will not blow out. A little candle that just has a little bit of light. He covers it and he protects it. If you feel you're in a weak place, if you feel like you're in a hurting place, Jesus is with you now to sympathize with you, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to speak life over you to help you win and conquer in the way of the Lamb. When you feel so discouraged, when you feel like it's not working, when you feel like it's taking so long, when you feel like this whole faith thing isn't working out, He is with you in that moment to lift up your spirits and to encourage you if you follow in the way of the Lamb. The call to conquer doesn't mean we're spared from suffering. It means we're promised His presence. In Revelation 12, it said they conquered by uh, being willing to lose their life. And I just want to as some of you, maybe on uh, Facebook or social media, or maybe you've been on Instagram, you've just seen it where people have tried to change people's views by just saying things. Like, I've been in that place. Has anybody ever tried to do that? Like, if you just say that one thing, then maybe they'll change, and they'll finally come to your side, right? And you'll, they'll finally get it right. But I've learned to discover something that you can't argue somebody into God's kingdom. You don't argue people into God's kingdom. But they can't argue his presence. They can't argue his presence in their life when they're in suffering, when they're in a place of defeat, when they're in a place of hopelessness, and the presence of Christ reveals himself to them. That's what wins them. But we're trying to win arguments. We're trying to prove we're right. We're trying to be on the winning side. But that's not how you win. And I found myself always experiencing victory, and I found myself being convinced not by when somebody's forced me to go to an argument or forced me to believe something. You couldn't force me to follow Jesus. You couldn't force me into Christianity. I was way too stubborn hearted. Just ask my mom. You couldn't force me to believe something. It wasn't by force I came to follow Jesus. It was by his great love. It was seeing his great love, his resilient love through suffering that compelled me to come to know him. And so this is what I want you to know tonight. We don't conquer like Christ by force. We conquer through the fortitude of our faith. We conquer through fortitude. And maybe some of you, you've never heard that word before. Fortitude simply means this. It means resistance and resilience. It means having strength. It means, in this context, resisting sin for the sake of another. It means I'm not going to use the way the world calls me to win to get my way. I'm going to choose God's way, and that's it. I'm not going to force somebody to see my side of view. I'm going to listen and understand and hear where they're at. That's how we win people to God's kingdom. That's how we reveal Christ, through our resilience and our resistance, to not sin against them and to continue to love even when they sin against us. 
Come on, that's what Jesus did for us. Scripture says that he died for us. He went to the cross for us. Not when we were repentant sinners. Not when we were turning our life around. Not when we quit doing that sin we say we would stop doing. But he did it when we were his enemies. He did it when we didn't turn to him. He did it when we didn't love him. And it was through fortitude. It was through resilience and resistance. And we're called to do the same. But I think for some of us, man, we are just thinking, we, we, have, to, we have to demand change from somebody. We, 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 we care so much, so much about the finished product and the end result and not how the person is experiencing Christ through the process. We don't care how they're receiving the gospel because they need to see this side. They, I need to be right or else. It's my way or the highway. But that's not how we reveal God's kingdom. It's through our resistance to sin against them when they sin against us. It's in our resilience to love them through any kind of suffering they bring at us. It means blessing them when they cuss you out. It means forgiving them when they hurt you. It means being patient with them when they are angry at you. It means honoring them when they are demeaning you. It means being humble when they're raising their voice at you. It means being gentle. Come on. It means being gentle when they're getting angry. It's loving them even when they won't love you. That's the way of the Lamb. That's the way to God's kingdom. That's how we'll reveal Christ to this broken and dying world. That's the most wisest and powerful choice. That's the way of influence. It's following his way, not through force. And it's only through God's spirit that that can be done. Let's look at the final part of our scripture tonight. Uh, verse 6, it said, The slain lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now remember that number seven. That means fullness and completion, perfection. It says seven spirits. That means the fullness of God's spirit. That doesn't mean literally seven different spirits. The fullness of God's spirit. It means God's spirit is all wise and all powerful. And it's sent out into the earth. How was it sent out into the earth? Through his Holy Spirit in us. We are his agents of change. We are the people who bring the change in this broken and dying world. Not the person who sits in the political office. We are. Christians, Christ followers who have God's spirit, the fullness of his spirit, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of power to overcome sin, the spirit of wisdom to see situations of what they really are. We are his agents of change. We bring his change into the earth. We bring his kingdom down. It's through his spirit that that's done. No other way. So have I at least done a fair job today convincing you that revelation maybe isn't so mystical and scary, that maybe it's a little bit more practical than we think? Maybe you can actually take some truths from it. Would you stand with me? I want to ask you one final question before we close. So what does this all mean? How do I win? How do I conquer in this life? How do I do it the way Jesus did? I want to ask you this question. Where am I lacking loyalty to Jesus in my life? Ask yourself that right now. Where am I lacking loyalty to Jesus in my life? And, I, and this question isn't posed to bring you guilt. It's an extension of his grace right now. It's an invitation to his grace to receive his power and wisdom, to live out that which you can't by faith. Where are you lacking loyalty to Jesus? Because he was so loyal to you. Loyal to the point that he went to a cross for you. Loyal to the point that he saw you in your complete darkened state. With all your sins revealed to him. From the day you were born to the day you'll die, he saw all of it. And he still saw you worthy of his life. And he was loyal to see that through by humbling himself, by dying on a cross. I think that means I can be, I can, I can be inspired to be loyal to him. So I want to ask you, maybe, maybe it's in your political stance. Maybe you are being more loyal to patriotism than God's kingdom. Maybe it's your speech. Maybe you're being more loyal uh, to, to how you feel and you're, you're demeaning others when they were deserving of his love. Or maybe you are lacking loyalty in the pursuit of your ambitions and dreams. And you're willing to manipulate and use others to get what you want instead of looking out for their best interest in mind. Where are you lacking loyalty to Jesus? Because that's where you're going to truly win. When you lay that thing down. When you lay it down and surrender to him. And then his victory will rise. And then life will rise and hope will rise. I want to pray for you right now. With every head bowed and eyes closed, I just want to ask this simple question. If you were here and you would say, man, I want to be more loyal to Jesus. I want to follow him all the days of my life because he gave so much for me. 
I feel that, but I don't know how. I want to pray for you. That the Holy Spirit would move in your heart and would encourage you and would give you faith to believe that he can do the impossible. That even when it looks like defeat, there is victory ahead. And I want to pray for another person, maybe in this room or watching online, and you're far from Jesus. And you aren't living out loyalty to Jesus at all. Matter of fact, you don't have a real relationship with him right now. I want to pray for you. That you would come to know his loyal love in this moment. You will come to know his faithful and never-ending love for you. His never-ending pursuit of you until the day you die, he will pursue you with his love. A reminding there is still hope for you. There is still a future for you and him. No matter how dark and how hopeless it seems. I want to pray for you. And if you're that person, all I want to ask you to do with every head bowed and eyes closed is just slip up your hand so I know who to pray for. If you would just say, pray for me. I want to give my, my heart to Jesus. I want to be loyal to him. I want to serve him. Awesome. Awesome. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a victorious king and you demonstrated that through your sacrifice on the cross. And Jesus, we're so thankful for your love. We receive your gift of new life by faith. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins, for being the son of God, for being a perfect sacrifice for us so we could have new life. We receive that by faith right now. Would you be our Lord? Would you be our Savior? And we commit by the help of your spirit to follow you all the days of our life. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's celebrate all those who just gave their heart to Christ. Thank you for tuning in to the Engedi Young Adults YouTube channel. If you enjoyed the teaching, make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss out on a single video or live stream. And share this video on your social media with a friend. Go ahead, do it right now. You never know how God could use this to impact someone's life or how many people it will reach for Jesus around the world. But don't stop there. Join us live every Thursday night at 7 p.m. at our Chicago Drive campus. We would love to get to know you personally and help you experience all that God has for you. For more information about Engedi Young Adults, head on over to our website down in the description link below. Again, Thank you so much for tuning in and God bless.